informs me while I'm going to the voting booth because there are as many opinions within the Brahma Kumaris as they are Brahma Kumaris. <laughs> so I can speak for myself. Um, I was thinking of four values that would inform me while voting, going to the voting booth and these values I have gleaned from my faith tradition. And the first value is that the candidate um, should care about people that his primary concern should be the people that he's going to be working for, that I should know that he cares about people and not just the fact that he's going to have a particular position in the country. That's the first one. And then the second one is that uh, he should have a balance, and a balance between idealism and um, practicality, that it shouldn't be, his um, policies shouldn't be too based on just idealistic or too much practical that there has to be a balance between both of them. And then the third one is that there has to be um, a, a separation from this dualistic approach to life, that something is really bad, or in, in the sense when I mean by dualistic approach to life is not get into a fever, in practically speaking, not get into a fever about what the most um, things are going, what is the most attractive thing right now, you know, like people seem to get into a fever about a lot of things, gay marriages or anything else, but that there isn't that this is right and this is wrong, but there isn't that dualism, but there is this balance and that, that he's not, um, he or she is not uh, having that approach, of dualistic approach to life. And the last one, which for me is one of the most important ones, is about being real. That they have to be based, the candidate themselves have to be real. Um, I wouldn't want to choose someone who is going to change his mind every <coughs> time the opinion polls change, or his rhetoric is completely based on opinion polls, or when they are talking that there's all sorts of political correctness in the talk, but there's nothing real about the talk, that I am not able to get any real substance from the talk. That's what would inform me. Thank you for having me. Robert Hamlick. What an honor to be here with all of you and to be able to talk about these ideas that are so dear to us. The Unity Movement and I'm to give a little introduction of that, is not really very well known yet. We are a best kept secret, I suppose. It didn't start out to be a religious movement. In 1889, a married couple, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore in the Midwest, decided to publish a magazine called Modern Thought. And in this magazine, there appeared articles that generally expressed the principle of idealism. That is, that mind, is primary and causative, that thoughts are things, and from that have arisen all of the other unity ideals. So this idea of the power of mind has really moved the unity movement. Charles and Myrtle Fillmore were ordained by Emma Curtis Hopkins, who had in the past assisted Mrs. Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, although she went her own way, and so did her students among them the founders of religious science, divine science, and any number of independent organizations that would identify with the term, in general, new thought. But unity is specifically not just new thought, but Christian idealism in the sense of looking to the Christ, that divine potential expressed through Jesus and through all great teachers throughout time, and all over the world. It's one who expressed these essential spiritual ideas of humanity. So, although there's no published creed of the unity movement, I'll give you my idea of the seven points that pretty much define our unity. And the first is that God may be known by many names, and we often are noticed for calling God Father or Father Mother. We are comfortable with that idea. Most unity ministers in the field are women, probably a little bit more than half, and there are probably less than a thousand unity groups in the world uh, that would be <coughs> our centers. 
The second point is the divinity of humanity as an essential trait of humankind. And the third, the irresistible nature of ideas to manifest. All the other points sort of derive from those three. The fourth being the freedom of the individual in matters of belief. So if you have 20 Unity students, you probably have at least 60 opinions. <laughs> and so it's very difficult to speak for this whole movement except to say that we believe that thoughts are things, that God is all, and that humankind is innately divine. We also look to Jesus as way shower, but we look also to all the great teachers of the world because we believe there is truth in every path and saints in every religion. We believe in the sacredness of the Bible and all scripture. And here's the trick, that the same kind of inspiration and wisdom is required to understand it as was required to compile it. So all scripture must be individually interpreted and personally applied. And we also believe in the power of prayer, unlimited, to illumine, bless, heal, prosper, and free. The golden rule is meant to be our standard of life. And from all of those principles, we go into the ballot box. Probably uh, there's no way to discern what side of the political spectrum most unity people would vote on, because it's pretty much like herding cats. But that's unity, and we're glad to be at the table today. Thank you.